this morning as well. And Father, we ask you to hear these prayers, this confession this morning for the sake of Christ. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Now lift up your heads and hear the good news to you from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, and who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Friend, that is the kind of God that you have this morning and a fabulous reason to stand if you are able and bless the Lord this morning with the Gloria Patri. find hymn number 83 there is something about this that name there is no other name by which we must be saved acts 412 the name of jesus The joy of the Lord is my strength. That's Nehemiah 8.10. Let us continue praising the Lord this morning. Dear Lord, I've fought for freedom for many nights and days. It's now on bended knee I come to you. These words, please hear me pray. For all my friends and patriots who never said a word, just raised their hand and gave a nod when they were asked to serve. Please honor them and hold them. Your love keep them from harm. 
May they find some peace tonight in your loving arms. For all who love this country and stood up so brave and true, it's only for her rights we fight. God bless the red, white, and blue. Amen. Uh, thankful to God this morning for our veterans. Uh, if you had experienced peril on the sea, if you are from, if you served in the Navy or in the Marine Corps, could you raise your hand for us? Yes, yes, all right. If you were experienced peril on the land, you served in the Army, please raise your hand for us to see. If you experienced peril in the air with our, with our Air Force, raise your hand. We don't have anybody in the Air Force, all right. And uh, if you served in a branch of the, of, the, of the military, raise your hand. In any branch, absolutely. We are very thankful to God for our veterans this morning, absolutely. And we've got a memorial board over here uh, for you to check and uh, see in our history, just as we remembered our uh, all the saints that went before us last week, so we are thankful for our veterans this morning. Uh, this turns our attention to prayer this morning, and you have a prayer and pray sheet, or a prayer sheet. Uh, we typically add things to it, so who would we add to our prayer sheet this morning? Yes. We 
Jeff Covert. Okay, a former member named Jeff Covert. Anne's asking for prayer for Jeff. Carol? Yeah, continue to pray for the Webbers. And uh, Bobby fell and broke her hand this week. So you can uh, pray for Bobby. Absolutely. Yes, Miss Dory. Okay. Sure, the, the folks in the Middle East who are uh, experiencing terrorist attacks, that God would help them get through all these things. Absolutely. Sue? People of Ukraine and world peace. Of Ukraine and world peace. Absolutely. Saw so somebody over here? Yes. Okay. You can pray for Todd Winograd, who's experiencing some difficult times. Absolutely. Anyone else this morning? Yes, Lori. Okay. Uh, your granddaughter, Clara, in the military in Spain, and she's at a decision point. So you can pray for Clara. Anyone else this morning? All right. Our, our single prompt this morning will be, uh, you know, you saw as you looked around, all our veterans. Um, so typically we, we focus on a couple of different things, but today we're just going to focus on prayer for our veterans, that uh, they would receive the kind of care and help that they need, and that our current uh, servicemen and women uh, would uh, receive the help that they need, and that uh, we'll just pray. All right. With that in mind, we have a, a uh, lead into prayer in your bulletin there, it's, it's Psalm 141, 1 and 2. Psalm 41, 1 and 2, let's read it together. O Lord, I call upon you, hasten to me, give ear to my voice when I call to you. Let my prayer be counted as incense before you, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. With that in mind, let us pray. Father, we are a thankful people this morning, thankful for a day of worship, thankful for uh, your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, thankful for your Spirit, thankful for your Word. Father, we are thankful for the ability to get to this building so that we might uh, join together with the saints who are in this building and those who have gone before us to say, holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. And Father, we are thankful to live at this time in history. Uh, we know that it's, there's never been a better time to be alive than now as far as receiving medical treatments and technology. And yet, Father, as wonderful as those things are, we still look around and we still see around us uh, despair and depression and dysfunction and pain and misery, broken relationships in a broken world. So Father, it's our desire to be a blessing even as you have blessed us in Christ. It's our desire to be a forgiving people even as you have forgived us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Father, we pray for comfort of those afflicted. Father, we would pray for Jeff Covert this morning. Father, we would pray for uh, Bobby Weber as she fell and broke her hand. Father, we would pray for those experiencing uh, terror attacks and disruption in the Middle East, as well as uh, the disruption in Ukraine. And Father, we ache and long for the day when all the swords have been beaten into plowshares because the Lord Jesus is reigning in his full glory. So Father, we pray for uh, the unrest in Ukraine. Father, we pray for Todd Winograd and his troubles. Father, we would pray for a granddaughter, Clara, in the service in Spain, that you would give her wisdom in her upcoming decision. Father, we would pray for those sick on our list, Mary Frances Galopoulos, Kyle Soretti, Charlotte Van Hook, Heather Hart, Chuck Holtz, Marlene Kraft, Jill Clemens, Robert Weber, Miguel Gonzalez, Artis Smith, Janet Winograd, Tessa Curtis, and for those battling cancer, Dan Driscoll and Pauline Wagner. Father, we also pray for 
uh, the, our missionaries, the Birdsalls, Tasha Taylor, Love Inc., Thule, and the Huber and Mapendi families, that you would lead them and guide them in, in getting the good news out from where you've placed them. And Father, we are also a thankful people uh, for our men and women who are our veterans. And so, Father, we pray for them, and we do so now. And Father, we are very thankful for our chief, the captain of the Lord's army of hosts, the Lord Jesus Christ, because he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, we do thank you for your ongoing contribution to the uh, work of Hope Church, that we would be a mission outpost of hope here on Allegheny Road and in Lake County and indeed the world. Uh, we don't want to be a museum. We want to be a mission outpost. Uh, we are the only agency that the Lord has authorized to get the good news out about Jesus. And if we don't do it, woe betide us. So thank you for your ongoing support. You can leave your tithes and offerings, your contributions out in the box, or you can uh, send them to the address on the screen. Uh, let's pray for our offering. Father, uh, again, we are a thankful people. And uh, we just respond out of the love and grace that you've shown us. We want to bless the Lord with all that is within us to bless your holy name. We want to forget not all your benefits, who forgives all our iniquities, who heals all our diseases, who redeems us from the life of the pit, who crowns us with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies us with good. And so, Father, because you have blessed us so, it's our desire to give ourselves to you through these tithes and these offerings, and not simply these, but our whole lives. Anything that we have that is good has come from your hand, and we give ourselves back to you today. And, uh, Father, if there's anything we can't give, we invite you to take it from us for the glory of the King and the good of the kingdom. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus we pray these things. Amen and amen come to the reading of Holy Scripture this morning. Our scripture this morning is from 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in, Je in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation.
Let's pray again as, as we are getting started with this uh, passage this morning. Let's pray. Uh, Father, come work in conjunction with your word and by your spirit uh, to equip us that we may live how you would have us to live. We ask you to work by your word and through your spirit to show us the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we again are a thankful people this morning. Holy Spirit, you're not simply welcome here. You are non-negotiable. Uh, Father, it's not up to me and cute phrases and words that I put together. It's up to your spirit. So definitely speak through me and to me and in spite of me this morning. And it's in the name of the Lord Jesus we pray these things. Amen and amen. If you were to take up a new sport or a hobby, <clears throat> there might be a lot you don't know about it. You might not know the actions to take or even where to get started or where to go or if you need a license or all, there's all sorts of stuff you need to know. The gear to get, the moves to make. You might not know what you need to know to be equipped to fish for catfish, for instance, or carp. Uh, my daddy was a bass fisherman. And you fish for catfish and carp differently than you do for bass, or at least largemouth bass. Uh, catfish and carp bait sits on the bottom of the stream or the lake. Why is that? Because catfish and carp are bottom feeders. They just, the bait just sits there, whether it's a dough ball or a cheese ball or Wheaties with strawberry soda ball or chicken liver, that one's kind of gross, just sits there so the fish comes over it. Now by contrast, uh, largemouth bass, they're into, seemingly into bait that seems lively. If you want to catch a largemouth bass, you would have a thing called a spinner bait, which is a little thing with a hook on it and it's got this little teardrop that's silver and it spins and churns up the water and it attracts the bass's attention. Or you might uh, use a reel or a plastic worm and drag it along the bottom. When you fish for catfish, you throw your bait out and you let it set. When you fish for bass, largemouth bass, at least in my experience with my dad, uh, you cast it and you reel because the bass is attracted to that movement. Now, you'll recall that Jesus calls his disciples to be fishers of men. Do you remember that? Yeah? Okay, okay, all right. And that's the image that he used for them. And we might not always think about is that not only did he call them to be fishers of men, but he also equipped them to be fishers of men. He provided them a lot of on-the-job training, didn't he? And what I want to suggest to you in our passage today, that you are no less equipped for your life with God and, have, and doing what he would have you to do than those disciples are, because you have been equipped because God has provided you his word. It's right there in our text. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believe, knowing from whom you learn it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for what? What's it say? How many good works? These particular five good works? Every good work. Paul makes a very interesting claim there at the beginning of verse 16. He says, all scripture is breathed out by God. 
Uh, when we come to apply our fancy $3 word to it, we call that the inspiration of Scripture. But it's probably better understood, it's rightly understood, as the expiration of Scripture. But that's a little bit tainted for us because we want nothing to do with expired things, do we? If the milk is expired, we stay away from it, right? But the word that Paul uses is that God has breathed his word out from his being. Sometimes when I've talked about this, I'll show a picture of, have you ever seen one of those uh, pictures where somebody captures somebody right when they sneeze and all the vapor that comes, all the droplets? God expired. He put out from himself his word. And we say it's inspired because his words are actually breathed out by himself. Paul says that they're breathed out by God, but we would stop and say, well, didn't Jeremiah write the book Jeremiah? What's the answer? Yes, Jeremiah wrote the book of Jeremiah. And it also came from God at the same time. We're not very good at things like that, but it's a both and situation. It's not an either or. We might even see, say that as the Lord breathed out the scriptures, the Holy Spirit, who's often associated with wind, uh, we might even say that, oh, well, I have jumped far ahead. Let's rewind a little bit. All scripture is breathed out by God. But when Paul was writing this, he was speaking about what we call the Old Testament. Okay? Boy, I have goofed this up radically. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna go backwards a little bit. When he was speaking, when when Paul was writing to Timothy, he said, You've known the scriptures. And what's he talking about? He's talking about the Old Testament. Okay? That's the scriptures that Timothy had the access to. Timothy was a younger pastor that Paul was writing these two letters, First and Second Timothy. He was writing them to him to instruct him on how to be a pastor. And he said, you've known the scriptures uh, from very early on, and from your childhood you've been acquainted with these sacred writings. And he's talking about the Old Testament. And this is the same Old Testament. These are the same words of scripture that Jesus himself quoted at Satan when Jesus was being tempted. And certainly, when we think about it, we've got the New Testament added to our Old Testament, and the same thing holds true. As a matter of fact, even when Peter was writing, he said something interesting about Paul's writings. Now, look at your equipped scripture sheet with me. I'm trying to train myself to go a little bit slower back and forth, right? Because it dawns on me that sometimes when I have you look here, I start in before we're all, we're all there. And it might even be that someday we would have a solution to switch him back and forth. All right, so 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. Peter says this, And count the patience of our Lord of salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. Okay, so he's, he's mentioning that Paul is writing to the churches. Verse 16, as he does in all his letters when he speaks of them in these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other what? Scriptures. So here you've got uh, both Peter and Paul having the Old Testament as the scriptures, but Peter recognizes here, you know, Paul is writing these letters, and when they show up, Ignorant and unstable people twist Paul's writings as they do the other scriptures. Do you see that Peter right there has put Paul's writings on par with the Old Testament? That's exactly what he has done. Paul is being recognized as writing scripture just like the Old Testament. And certainly... Uh, Paul teaches us that the scriptures, again, are what we call inspired, and they were breathed out by God, and it's not an either or, and we might even say that the Lord breathes out the scriptures, the Holy Spirit, who's often associated with wind, was moving and blowing the writers to write the word. This is 2 Peter 1, 19 to 21 there in your, in your handout. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention is to a lamp shining in a dark place 
until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by whom? The Holy Spirit. So our understanding of the scripture is that this is God's words written by man's hand. So that when Paul writes, God is smart enough to be able to get Paul to write what God wants him to write. And yet, Paul is writing, writing what he thinks the churches need to know. Same way with Peter, same way with John, same way with all the other New Testament writers. And ultimately, all the scriptures have their source in the Lord. And they are of great use. As a matter of fact, Paul says there in verse 16 in our Timothy passage, all scripture is breathed out by God and is what? Profitable. Means that they are able to do what they are designed to do. Just as a hammer is designed for what? Driving a nail, right? Uh, just as a screwdriver is designed to drive in a screw or pull out a screw, the scriptures are designed for a task and they are reliable in what they are teaching and they are suited to their task. We think of the words of the prophet Isaiah. Look on the back sheet of your equip sheet. Isaiah 55, 8 to 11. This is God speaking. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Well, <laughs> wow. Kind of seems like God's God and we're not, right? Okay. Uh, verse 10, for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. When the water does its work, it bears fruit, right? So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God's words are reliable in what they teach, and they are suited to their task. So what are the scriptures profitable for, according to our Timothy passage? What have they been designed by God to do, and why did God breathe them out? The first reason he breathed them out was for his own glory. Uh, that's, that's a given. But in our passage, why did God breathe them out? All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching. Teaching is the first thing that's mentioned, right? Scriptures were breathed out by God to teach us. Now, certainly you can use any piece of literature to teach anything, right? And uh, sometimes the scriptures have been used in literacy programs to teach people to read. <laughs> Did you know that? Sometimes in reading programs, people are like, hey, you want to learn to read? Let's read the Bible. It's like a double whammy there, right? Uh, if you had to summarize what the scriptures primarily teach, uh, what would you say? Well, certainly the big thing that the scriptures teach is about who God is, right? Who he is and what he does for his people and how we might live in response to the grace that he's shown us. The scriptures teach us what we must believe about God and what he requires of us. Ultimately, the scriptures teach us the gospel. Now, certainly when the scriptures are teaching, they're doing the next thing that they've been designed to do. They are profitable for teaching, but Paul also says they are profitable for reproof. <laughs> Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Reproof. Reproof is what happens when you've been doing something right or wrong. Wrong, right? I mean, wait, that, this is, that's confusing. Reproof. You don't need to reprove somebody who's doing the thing, right? But if they're not doing the thing, or if they're doing the thing in a weird way, you get reproved, okay? That is, they call us to account. They reprimand us. They rebuke us. They call us out. Uh, sometimes we will say, it reads us even as we are reading it. <laughs> All that is to say is that when we read the scriptures, it tells us what we should be doing, and it reads us. Like, oh, my goodness, I, I'm being reproved here, okay? 
It's showing us where we have missed the mark with regard to loving God and our neighbor. It was, certainly came through in our prayer of confession this morning, right? Uh, the scriptures are not only profitable for teaching, they're profitable for reproof, but they're also profitable for, what's the next thing Paul says there in verse 16? Correction. So the scriptures reprove us when we go wrong, but they also show us the right thing to do. Micah 6, 8 on your extra sheet, he has told you, O man, what is good. He's told you what is good. God has told us what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Again, those are kind of negative, negative and positive things when you are reproved, then you are also corrected, okay? <laughs> um, don't do this. Do this instead. Reproof and correction. What would you feel like if somebody just only reproved you? We just kind of wilt, don't we, right? Uh, the psychologists who study these things say that we get this kind of learned helplessness, right? Just, mm, mm. Uh, one of the things I uh, had a penchant for but despise about being a band director is that I was an error detector. You got this wrong. You're out of step. Blah, 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 blah. Okay? Reproof and correction. Don't do that. Do do this. Now, in addition to all these things, the scripture is profitable for training in righteousness. So if the doctor tells you, oh, I've replaced your hip, I've replaced your knee, you are getting at a certain age where you need to start an exercise regimen, and we get some PT, what does your PT person do? They train you in what to do. They train you. They would be the one you would go to to learn about getting in shape or what would be the best exercises for you as your knee is recuperating from being replaced. They would reprove you when you have ignored your exercises. Boy, uh, you go to the dentist, and the, when the dentist asks, have you, been, have you been flossing? Does the dentist really need that information from you? Right. I mean, they, they know, right? Okay. Reprove, and then correction. You should probably think about flossing, right? And they would correct you. You know, when you do this certain exercise, don't bend over. That's going to cause more problems. Keep your back straight. They would train you in physical fitness, this personal trainer. The same is true of the scriptures. They've been breathed out by the Lord for your training, teaching us to live in a manner that the Lord would have us live, to say the things that the Lord would have us to say in the way in which he would have us to say them as we are fishing for men and women and children. We don't need to get too exercised in our passage about Paul just saying that, uh, or Jesus saying we're fishing for men, because we understand what he's getting at, right? And what is the result of the Lord giving this scripture about breathing it out, about it being profitable and achieving what, it, what its aim is, about reproving us and correcting us and training us in righteousness. What's the, what's the goal? Verse 17, that the man or woman or child of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. As a matter of fact, you know, that's a big deal. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 on our other sheet. By grace you've been saved through faith. We've, we've talked about this probably every week. This is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one would boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And not only did he prepare those good works beforehand that we should walk in them, he is also equipping you by his word so that you would walk in them. And again, God gets to decide what good works are. If it's in his word and he commands it or prohibits it, if 
he prohibits it, then staying away from it is a good work. If he commands it, then doing it is a good work. Not getting a shelter dog and getting one from a store is not necessarily a good work. Our culture may think it's a big deal, and it's okay, right? But God gets to decide what a good work is, not our friends and our culture. So what we see today is that the scriptures are sufficient and inspired words from the Lord to equip you for life with God and his world as we as a congregation and individually fish for men. That's what Paul says there up in verse 15. And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you what? Wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The scriptures are sufficient to get people to Jesus. To make folks wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. So they're sufficient for you, congregation of hope, as we worship and witness. He tells us how he wants to be worshipped. He also tells us that we should be witnessing for him. In Jesus' words, fishing for men. Again, our desire here at Hope is to experience hope in worship and extend hope in witness. Worship and witness. And we are equipped to do both of those through the word. So if that's where our equipping comes from, How do we get equipped? Well, why do you think we try to pack a lot of Bible in our liturgy, right? I remember <laughs> there's the cutest little video of this fella uh, <laughs> somewhere in Asia. And he's in his school, and all the other kids are reading the book, and he's going like this. as though he can actually just scoop up the information in the book without actually engaging with the book, right? Super cute. Uh, but I don't think that works, right? So if this is to equip you, then we need to be paying some attention to it, right? The Lord has given us his word, and it is sufficient for us as we worship and witness. He's given us his word so that we would be equipped so that we should continue in what we learn and believe from his word. That's why as long as I have my mind about me, I'm not going to go on for 25 minutes from my journal or my diary. First of all, because I don't keep a journal or a diary. And second of all, it's my job to help you understand how, to, how you're being equipped. Now, I'm not sure of the exact parallels of fishing for men, as Jesus told us, and fishing for catfish and carp or bass. I don't know, you know, that if you were to, to get Jesus to show up here and say, Jesus, is fishing for men, are there some bottom feeders or are there some that are like car? Uh, or are there some that are like bass, and you got to be really flashy and keep? Re I don't know. The, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but I know that it takes that it, that 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 dead folks are dead. And I know that what God has chosen to equip us with is His Word about His Son. And what I want to encourage you with this morning. The scriptures, the Lord has equipped you for the work, and the Spirit is pleased to use the word so that many men, women, and children might come to know Jesus and come to know him better. And what that means is that there is hope for Lake County, and his name is Jesus. So hear it, tell it, learn it, continue in it, believe it, so that many may live. Let's pray. Father, uh, we thank you for your word. Equip us. Help us to avail ourselves of it. Father, uh, we've got multiple copies of it. So, Father, uh, stir in us a thirst and a hunger for your word so that we might be equipped to live as you would have us live. 
Help us to worship you according to it. Help us to witness and extend hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for him, and it's in his name we pray these things. Amen and amen. Please find in your bulletin the Apostles' Creed this morning. And so we will confess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. And again, since it talks about God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit, we, we pause after the first two paragraphs. And so I would ask you here, saints gathered at, on, Har uh, on uh, Allegheny Road here this morning, do you believe in God? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Do you also believe in his Son? and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Having confessed faith in the Father and the Son, do you also confess faith in the Spirit. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please find on the back side of your Apostles' Creed uh, our communion hymn, The King's Feast. The King's Feast. We'll remain seated this morning as we prepare to dine at the table of the King. Let us sing together. Therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. I would remind you of the words of the Heidelberg Catechism question and answer 81. Who should come to the Lord's table? Answer, those who are displeased with themselves because of their sins but who nevertheless trust that their sins are pardoned and that their remaining weakness is covered by the suffering and death of Christ and who also desire more and more to strengthen their faith and to lead a better life. Hypocrites and those who are unrepentant, however, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Uh, friends, the table is set for you. Not only has the Lord given you his word to equip you, he's given you the sacraments to strengthen you. 
And these work in conjunction with each other. And so the Lord has given you this meal to strengthen you, to strengthen your faith, so that you might have strength to walk in the ways of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you are a stumbling, fumbling disciple who nevertheless desires to walk in the way that the Lord would have you walk, this feast is for you. If you hear my voice today and you really don't care about the claim that Jesus rightfully has on your life and you're doing just fine without him and you don't need him every hour of every minute of every day, we are glad you are here, but we would ask that you would let these elements pass. But the feast is set. Let's pray. Father, uh, take this ordinary element, this bread and this cup, Use them for an extraordinary purpose to strengthen our faith, to help us trust you more, and to strengthen our bodies so that we might do your will more and more. Father, the end result is we ask you to make us like Jesus through this meal. We thank you for him. It's in his name we pray these things. Amen. The night when he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Dear saints, this is the bread from heaven, the Paschal Lamb that has been sacrificed for you. So taste and see that the Lord is good. In the same way also after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me and so friends know that as surely as you see and taste and touch and smell the cup that the Lord Jesus, the Paschal Lamb, gave his blood for you. Indeed, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Let us pray. Father, um, to all appearances, this seems to be a, an odd <laughs> ceremony with a little bit of calories attached to it. But Father, we trust you that you work through even such things as these. And so Father, we ask again, as we yield ourselves to you, that you would strengthen our faith and give us strength, having been equipped, that we would do your will. We thank you again for the Lord Jesus, the master of the feast. Uh, make us more like him, and it's in his name we pray these things. Amen and amen. Please stand if you are able, and we will sing our final hymn this morning. Hymn number 589, Here I Am, Lord. Say.
As you've just committed yourself to go, in your going, I would also remind you that uh, you're more than welcome to stick around for Lord's Day delights, and then you go. Uh, but take with you a good word from the Lord. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all the people said, Amen. Amen. May the grace of Christ our Savior and the Father's boundless love with the Holy Spirit's favor rest upon us from above. Thus we reabide in you with each other and the Lord, and possess in sweet communion joys which earth cannot afford.